Um, if you hold your cell phone to your ear for too long, you start to feel pain in your head. Um, if you are in the presence of a wireless um, you know, thing in your house for internet, um, that's frying your cells. You know, everybody knows about this, You're aware of this, electromagnetic frequency pollution, there's various terms for it, dissonant electromagnetic frequencies, um, cell towers. Um, for starters, just to be aware of the fact that um, this is more and more a part of our lives these days. And if there are these tools, if there are these man-made things that are projecting out dissonance into our environment, um, that dissonant frequency is being, is affecting our plants, right? Wherever that dissonance is being projected, that is being, you know, received by our antenna systems, not just our bodies, not just our children, but our plants. This is, I try to keep things at least somewhat relevant to farming when I talk about such topics. Um, so the idea here basically is if we are able to devise tools that project dissonance, we then therefore should be able to project, we should develop tools that project coherence, right? We don't need to be victims necessarily. We can take our power and we can create coherence as well. We can actively project coherence just as easily as we can project dissonance. So I've got a few names here of people who have done work um, in building tools that are designed to project coherence in the environment. Um, we're getting further and further away from topics where I feel like I know what I'm talking about, um, but I still feel like this is important and something we should be talking about. So um, um, Bruce Tanio recently passed, Hugh Lovell's still around, uh, Galen Hieronymus was uh, Lovell's teacher. Um, uh, the terms that are of art that are used in, in, you know, in the farming field are cosmic pipes and field tuners. They're basically tools that, are, that you can you know, plug into the ground that will project coherence into the environment. Um, I would, from my understanding, Bruce Tanio was one of the most sophisticated ones. Um, it produced some really high-end um, tools. I have one of his in my house, which is a plug into the house, one which gives you a 4,000 square foot of coherence. Um, which covers the wireless from the computer. Um, um, but there's other ones that you can plug in in the ground outside to a tree and it'll be a mile and a half or five mile um, coherent fields. It's so, like Slim Sperling. What's that? It's like Slim Sperling. Slim Sperling was doing like stuff. There's a lot of people, a lot, a lot of people like doing this kind of stuff, have been doing it, talk about it. I don't know enough to say who's you know full of it and a good marketer and who's actually doing the real thing. Um, I think one must be very skeptical because oftentimes the cost for these things is very high and I'm always a little bit skeptical when energy tools cost a lot. <laughs> Do you think the one works in your house? I know that we all slept deeply for about a month after we plugged that in. Oh. Like we just, oh, it was like this like, like deeper sleep, just, just like really the kids, everybody was just significant. Um, so, um, but Bruce was, I met uh, Bruce, I know, I mean, he's died, he's, he has died, but I, um, I mean, I would put him on a level with, with um, Reams and, and maybe um, Steiner, another one of those extremely sensitive, um, you know, um, very clairvoyant, um, you know, Tesla, people like that, that really were operating on a whole other level, um, and that we don't really properly understand where they're coming from and what they were up to. Um, what is so, the cost of that? Ah, um, well, actually, interesting. <laughs> we should bring that up. I think the retail cost is like 500 bucks, but if you um, buy them in bulk, as we are hoping to have available to the chapters through the depots, they're like 230 or 240. You can make so, them around too. Um, there are lots of different ways of making them. You can make orbital generators. You can make these little pyramid things. There's all kinds of stuff out there on the web. Um, I don't feel confident to discern what's true and what's not, and how, how intense and how complete, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I, I, the basic understanding I have is, remember that, um, some of you guys are old enough, remember in the 90s they had this, uh, this is your brain, this is your brain on drugs? Yeah. Remember that? The day I had the Friday. I would say, this is your brain, this is your brain on EMFs. I mean, literally, EMFs, electromagnetic frequency, as I understand it, fries your protoplasm like an egg. You hold that cell phone to your ear, what you're feeling in your head is your cells being fried, right? 
And they can prove that with demography. And, 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 and there's plenty of data to support it. So let's be present with the fact that this is part of reality, not just try to ignore it. Um, and be sensitive to your plants as well, even though around here you have much less EMF pollution than you have in New York City. Um, you know, I can't handle the city personally. I'll get in there, I'll get the hell right back out. Just as long as they don't sleep in the city, I'm fine. But if I spend a night in the city, you ever open a computer in the city and there's like 45 wirelesses? Yes. That you can tune into? Like you are in the field right now of 45 different people's wireless signal. Like it's a long list. <laughs> We're just going to antennasearch.com and you'll see how many repeaters there are. By your by your address? Yeah. Like in New York, there's like 80 towers. It's in a three mile area. It's really intense, everybody. and I feel it. I feel jangled myself, yeah. and and just yeah. So anyway, okay. Last on the topic. Um, water is my last topic, um, and we started the water conversation yesterday. Um, Masaru Emoto is someone who many people have um, become aware of. His book um, Messages from Water was a picture book. Um, sorry, what was that? He was a, a Japanese uh, scientist. He um, took, he would take tap water and put it in vials, in little mud vials, in little test tubes, and um, he would say to one test tube of full of water, "I hate you," and stick it in the freezer, and say to the next test tube of water, "I love you," and put it in the freezer, and then when the Ice froze, he'd take it out and take a picture of the crystalline structure of the water. How many people have seen these pictures? A few people have seen these pictures. It's ridiculous, right? I mean, it's totally ridiculous. The, the, the difference in the crystalline structure of the water, with nothing else having been done except for a, a, an emotion, a feeling, a thought. Or just the words. Being projected. Or just the words. Then he would write the words on a piece of tape. Mm -hmm. and put one piece of tape on one vial, on one test tube, and one on the other. In any language. In any language. Um, it was, I mean, absolutely very, very intriguing. So water, we talked about irrigation and all that kind of stuff yesterday. I do have uh, Victor Schauberger's name on here. Um, Victor Schauberger was an Austrian, I think he was a forester. Yeah. And his job was to um, catch poachers. And so he had to sit quietly in the forest all night. <laughs> waiting for poachers. And so we had plenty of time to cut tape on things. <laughs> Another guy was discredited. Um, he and, was, too. Yes, and he was able to get free energy out of the and water. Levitate, and levitation. And levitation. Levity. Um, he watched the salmon. Uh, he had a spot where he liked to sit, as I understand it. I mean, he was the guy who watched water flow downhill and watched it go like this and like this, mm -hmm. and said, water likes to go in a spiral. That's what water does. That's how water likes to be happy. This is how we energize water. He would watch the fish at moonlight circling around the pond below the um, waterfall. And he'd watch them circle and circle and circle and circle and circle and then do like a 40 or 50 foot jump over the waterfall. And he's like, okay, so we know this is true, right? We know fish jump. and they jump really high and really far, and we don't really have the explanation for how that works, right? And so he was interested in this whole question of water and vortexing and spinning and temperature. I think he said 38 degrees was the op optimal temperature when water has the most vitality. Um, but um, there's all this really, really interesting stuff about water. What we do know about water is you can take a picture of the photons, the light, the energy, in water, and if you take a picture of light in water before it goes through a tube, a pipe, a hose, and after it leaves the hose or the pipe, you will always have less light, less energy in it after it goes through a straight pipe. Water does not like to move in straight lines. You suck the life force out of water when you put it through a pipe. That is one of, I think, um, Schauberger's uh, comments about water. So, um, you know, when we talk about irrigation systems and keeping the soil moist and all that kind of stuff and logistics, we understand that the water we're using from pumps, from wells, etc., um, you know, is we are, we're, we're taking some of the energy out of the water. <clears throat> and if the life, our plants, are responding to the energy in the water, then the question becomes is there a way we can project or we can 
put that coherence back into the water? Can we put structure back into the water? Can we put that spin, those photons, that magnetic field strength back into the water? So another topic area where there's a lot of hocus pocus, a lot of people selling things that are really expensive. Um, there's some foundational insights and some science that's it's really true, I think, and some simple things you can build and make um, okay. to um, put in your water line, in your irrigation line, to add structure back into the water if you're going to be irrigating with it. So um, again, I don't feel like I know enough to speak confidently about what you should do, but I do feel like this is an important piece of reality that we need to be aware of and integrating into our overall management have practices. You, have you heard of trap water before? Trap? Yeah. I don't think so. I don't know hardly anything about it. That's like just, I, I've looked up this water thing before in like yeah. vortexes and, and mostly on YouTube. Yeah. And I came across like this video of people making trap water and it has something to do with like like magnets are involved mm -hmm. and it's like isolating the water that's the highest energy. Like if you have a constant like say you run a pipe from your stream mm -hmm. constant flow and it's like a way of isolating the best water. It's just basically they call it trap water. I don't know, it might be something it's you warm. can look at. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. basically all I suggest is um, if this is intriguing to you, figure out ways you can on your farm experiment with different things and see if you can see noticeable results. Because if it's true and it works, then we can you know tell tell each other about it. Yes. So I did a test uh, myself in the garden actually. We first cooked rice, yeah, white rice, put it in two different bottles. Uh, and one we said very nasty words to, and the other I completely closed it, water it airtight. Yeah. And waited about two two weeks, two and a half weeks, and one to the one that we shouted at turned black. Mm -hmm. Can you have stay clear? That's very interesting. Mm -hmm. And then on, on, on sort of on your note, like in Holland, I noticed very large uh, biodynamic farmer who has a, it's called a bio ditch for his water. So he gets his water from his greenhouse that comes into a big pond. And, yeah. You know, normally farmers just let it sit there and know why they need it, they you know, use it in the greenhouse. He lets it go through a through a ditch with all these plants and frogs and yeah. fish. And, and, and then it streams back up into the pond. So there's a whole constant movement of this water. Yeah. And he's proven that basically it's the quality of his produce was impacted because of that. My brother works for this guy. And it's, yeah. it's impressive. I, on my farm, I basically have done a series of ponds that run down <laughs> the wet part of the land. So the water, um, it's like a flow form basically in the land. And I've got one, two, three, four, five, six, and then seven ponds that the water comes down from one pond to the next pond to the next pond to the next pond. Um, that idea of the biodynamic flow form thing I thought was really cool. And that's, I've been <clears throat> attempting to build something like that on the land. So that's where I get my water from for my irrigation purposes. But um, speak in India, that's how they do it in India. Yeah. That's how they spin their water. Yeah, because of flow form. Yep. Yeah. All right. Any other comments? Last two slides. Um, uh, last two slides are local natural solutions, um, seawater, and rock dust. Um, I like to just sort of leave on this very rudimentary, very basic level. Um, I think you know between the seawater and the rock dust, we have everything we would ever need to bring in from offsite to dramatically, rapidly, systemically revitalize not our land only, but the whole planet. I truly believe that the whole planet is um, is um, in need of some significant revitalization, and I think we have the, the tools and knowledge um, already there, and the tools and materials um, as readily available and as inexpensive and as local as as these two basic um, areas. So, um, just I don't know if anybody else has been to other parts of the world, traveled in other countries, other continents. Um, been to the developing world where things are much worse for a lot of people as far as quality of life, um, difficulty, and struggle. Um, but my experience is that uh, we are remarkably comfortable, remarkably safe, remarkably affluent um, here. And there's not that many of us, really, Americans and Westerners. There's a whole bunch more people in other parts of the, of the world, in other countries, that are struggling um, 
in some very basic rudimentary ways. Um, and uh, I don't know, for me, I have a, I have a, um, a desire to work to create a reality where it's not like that. Um, and I, um, I feel like we have the tools, we have the capacities through working with nature, through intelligently and thoughtfully um, you know, building soil back and proving that we can do amazing things with, with these simple, simple resources. Um, when I came back from India, I just I felt like this was really the work I wanted to do was you know getting better food into people's bodies, um, and I felt like my base of operations was here in North America because I was born here, since my family's here and I got relationships here. But um, I think if we can you know together, if this is true, and we can through our practice verify it and share it with others. Um, we can build the intellectual capital necessary to really um, have a dramatically positive effect on the rest of the world. I think the rest of the world is, a lot of places are really receptive to um, good practical solutions. Um, so if this is intriguing to other people, um, for your own per personal purposes, that's one thing, but if we can actually coordinate and work together, um, I think we can, we can really uh, have a dramatically positive effect. Yeah on the rest of the world. So, um, that's not a very eloquent way to end, but um, <laughs> that's what I've got. So, anyway, thank you all very much. Class is dismissed. Feel free to join the organization.